few minutes right now. Uh, just request you all to stay tuned. Uh, you can have a look at the screen in the meanwhile, and uh, we'll be starting within a couple of minutes. Thank you. My name is Nikhil Kochar, and uh, I'm the chief advisor to the IIA India, as well as an independent director in a listed company. Uh, I'm going to be your moderator for today. It is indeed a pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you. The first in a series of joint webinars being conducted between Protivity and IIA India. I'm happy to inform you that as of 10 a.m. in the morning, we had already clocked 990 registrations. The interesting and pleasant surprise was that we had over 150 participants who were from 24 countries other than India. This includes Singapore, which came on top with 47 participants, 22 from the USA, uh, 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 again, 26 from Sri Lanka, and other participants from UK, uh, from the Middle East, from Africa, and various other countries. It was also indeed a pleasure to see that we had a former union minister registering with us, Mr. K. Rahman Khan. Uh, a big welcome to you, Mr. Khan, if you are also there. And uh, out of all these participants, definitely last but not the least, uh, with over 900 and uh, I would say uh, 900 participants from India, uh, you know, as of uh, what has just been informed to me a few minutes ago, we have actually crossed 1150 registrations, which certainly is a record for us. I think I would be failing in my duties if I did not give a big thank you to Prodivity for helping organize uh, and all the support for helping create this particular joint event, which I hope all the participants uh, would be able to enjoy and learn from. A uh, special mention, if I may, to uh, Mr. Sanjeev Agarwal, my friend Sachin Tayal, Nirmal Yogupta, Puneet Gupta, and Satish Shrivastav from Protivity. The structuring for the webinar would be as follows. I would first be giving an introduction to our distinguished panelists. Spend a couple of minutes on inverted commas, setting the context for the webinar. After that, we would be posing questions to the panelists. I must add over here that other panelists are most welcome to add their point of view wherever they wish to. Uh, we would also welcome your participation and would be doing that through two means. Uh, after some of the questions which I would be posing to the panelists, we would uh, be following them up with online polls so that we can kind of get a pulse uh, of the internal audit profession's thoughts and views in this matter. In addition, after the program uh, of questioning is over, we would be opening up the house for question and answers. You're most welcome to keep posing your questions throughout uh, the program. And Satish would uh, kindly uh, share those questions or read them out to us uh, based on the ones which he feels are most relevant. Uh, we would have to give him discretion in that because I do expect there would be a lot of questions. Uh, we were proposing to have this uh, program last for about one hour, but uh, if you can make it interesting for us by sending in lots of questions, uh, I'm sure we would be happy to extend it by another 15 minutes uh, if required. Uh, you would have on the right-hand side of your screen a Q&A uh, box, which is like a chat box, so you can pose your questions over there. And if you permit, uh, I would now like to introduce uh, all the panelists, the distinguished panelists which we have with us for this evening. Dr. Ashok Haldia, I think is a name familiar to most people from the Chartered Accountancy Fraternity. He's a former MD and CEO of PTC India Financial Services and led it for a decade from being a new entity to a leading financial institution. 
He was also secretary of the ICAI and led its transformation at national and international levels for more than 10 years. Dr. Haldia was also a member of the appellate tribunal for the ICAI, ICSI, ICWAI, and of the National Advisory Committee on Accounting Standards. In his earlier roles, Dr. Haldia has been with the Power Finance Corporation with responsibilities for pursuing uh, reforms sorry, in state power utilities linked to the World Bank oblique ADB line of credit. He has been on more than 20 committees appointed by the government of India, state government, ICAI, chambers of commerce, and many international bodies, and is currently an advisor on various matters with boards and committees of IFAC, SAFA, CAPA, ICAI, CII, and ASOCHAM. He is also chairman of the governing board of IIIPI and has contributed to various financial dailies, conferences, and seminars. The second panelist I'm going to introduce is Mr. Mukundan Ramakrishnan. Mr. Mukundan is the MD of Tata Chemicals. During his 26 year career with the Tata Group, he's held various responsibilities across chemical, automotive, hospitality sectors of the group. He serves on the executive committees of various industry forums, including uh, the CII, the Bombay Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Employers Federation of India, AIMA, etc. An engineer from IIT Roorkee, he joined the Tata Administrative Services, better known as TAS, in 1990 after completion of MBA from FMS Delhi University. He's also an alumnus of the Harvard Business School. And our third panelist is Mr. Bhaskar Pramanik, again, very distinguished, who you must have heard about, an accomplished management leader and a professional from the technology industry. Mr. Pramanik has held national and global leadership positions in leading multinational technology companies across India, Singapore, and the US. He retired as chairperson of Microsoft India in September 2017 after a successful 45 years career in the industry. If you look at him, it doesn't look like it, that he's that, uh, that experienced. Uh, he, he certainly seems a lot younger. Prior to this, he was the MD of Oracle Corporation and Sun Microsystems in India. Currently, he's an independent board member and is also on the advisory board of a number of companies and organizations. Culture and strategy, leadership and organizational excellence, corporate governance, diversity and inclusion, innovation and transformation, performing and transforming are some of his major interest areas. Uh, I was also uh, very uh, pleased and enlightened to hear a couple of days back when we interacted that Mr. Bhaskar Pramanik has also headed the internal audit function in Microsoft. So if I may now proceed to talk a little bit about the context for today's topic, which is expectations from internal audit, a board perspective. We have been hearing over the years that change is the only constant. I personally feel that change is now a necessity. And for many of us, it's actually been thrust upon us. We have been witnessing over the last 10 to 15 years, the changes in the expectations from the internal audit profession. As mentioned, uh, by the renowned president and CEO of II India, Mr. Richard Chambers. Internal auditors have needed to move from hindsight to insight to foresight. When we started out, and my internal auditing actually started out in the 1980s, internal auditing primarily consisted of just a review of financial transactions. And I still remember when we were trying to review the manufacturing operations of a chemical industry client, they were asking us that, hey, is this also a part of internal audit? Is it a part of your scope? Because they didn't expect it. By and large, what we used to do were post-mortems. However, as time has passed, uh, I think we have had an increased knowledge of business operations, risks, and done an increasing amount of analyses which has allowed internal auditors to also start contributing to insights as far as the organization is concerned. However, the requirements of today are changing even further. We are expected to have a laser sharp focus on the risk horizon combined with business knowledge 
analytics, soft skills, and a heavy reliance on technology that would allow the internal audit profession to add value on the foresight front. If we see it from the board perspective, simultaneously, there have been increased expectations from multiple stakeholders on the board as well. And please permit me to use the words board and audit committee interchangeably. This includes expectations from regulated, uh, regulatory authorities, shareholder activism, proxy advisories, corporate investors, and an increasingly volatile risk landscape, all of which have combined to make the task of the board and the audit committee a lot more demanding than it was earlier. The logical expectation is that the audit committee and the board uh, you know, would actually have to increasingly rely on the internal audit function to be its hands, eyes, and ears as to what is happening on the ground and to help them find this out. I think the key question which we would like to have insights on today is, is that really happening? Has our profession been able to rise to the occasion? Does internal audit really meet the board or audit committee's expectations? Does it have the organizational status and independence to discharge these responsibilities? What role can the board play in supporting internal auditors? And how does internal audit transform itself in this work for home and COVID environment into performing on the digital stage and in the digital age. We really want to be looking forward to the responses and the insights which we have from our distinguished panelists. In the meanwhile, very happy to inform you that our participant numbers have already crossed 626 as I speak, and I do hope they will keep increasing, but we must move on to the next stage of questions my first question is going to be directed at Mr. Bhaskar Pramanik. That's so, from an independent director's perspective, what are the expectations of the board from the internal audit function? And is the function, the internal auditors, are they able to meet these expectations? We would like to hear from you, sir. Uh, so you may need to unmute yourself, please. Uh, I think you're on mute, uh, Mr. Pramanik. Thank you. Sorry. So first of all, thank you for the introduction. I just want to clarify, I was not the head of internal audit. I raised the stature of internal audit in Microsoft, uh, mainly because uh, at that point of time, we were facing a multitude of different channels. And therefore, I had to raise the, uh, the level and the stature of uh, the internal audit team. Uh, and they were it, actually so. very, very crucial to the turnaround uh, situation, yeah, which we were planning in. So first right. of all, um, you know, uh, the other panelists are very distinguished, and um, I'm an engineer, just like uh, Mr. Mitchell. I also started my career with the Tata Group, uh, and I spent over 10 years with them. And um, basically, my responses to your question and my participation in the panel is both um, from the perspective of management, uh, which is what I was uh, really uh, from two uh, till 2017. And I'll also talk about my experiences as a board member and equally uh, how important the role of internal audit is. So first so, of all, what is the, um, the role of internal audit? What is the expectation? So, you know, I'll, again, whether it's management or whether it's the board, it is about providing an independent assurance on the organizational effectiveness of risk management, governance, and internal controls and processes. And this has become much more important in the current uh, last decade than I've ever seen it before. And primarily because of the complexity of operations, uh, digital or the, uh, you know, the, the fact that technology is now placing, playing a much bigger role both within the company as well as reaching out to customers and also because of the global and regulatory requirements which most companies have to, uh, to meet. 
and therefore having an organization within the uh, within the company to basically focus on risk management governance and internal process uh, control processes has become more and more important a lot of people uh, within the organization look at internal audit as a uh, you know showstopper it prevents them to really accelerate their business uh, especially for sales people they consider it a nuisance but even for other operation people they consider it as a challenge but i, I have seen actually and I, you know this was where i had an opportunity to work very closely with the internal audit team in an organization like microsoft we actually took it from where believe people believe that it was a showstopper to where it everybody within the organization in a sense felt that they were part of the internal audit team especially with regard to compliance and therefore the message which internal audit was able to give was over a period of 3 years they said that not only must we do the right things but we need to do it right the first time and wow. therefore that was the um you know that was actually the mission of the internal audit team so it went beyond just uh, you know <coughs> reviewing or actually auditing uh, the internal control processes uh it's in the state bank of india where i've actually seen internal audit play a huge role in terms of managing risk because especially for public sector banks uh the whole uh, system has moved towards uh looking at risk management as the core uh purpose of the board as well as the management of the organization and everything is looked at and all decisions are taken from the perspective of risk so while in the public sector banks and large banks you do have a chief risk officer who's constantly evaluating the different risks who's looking at the different model it is for the internal audit team to actually make sure that these processes are using the right data they are fall they are actually giving the delivering the results or the uh, which which are uh, which are important and then they are actually auditing the internal processes etc especially for an organization the size of sbi uh, technology becomes another big important area and the internal audit team of sbi was also auditing the uh, cyber security and the data security uh, policies of the government of the uh, state bank of india so these are some of the activities which we talked about now going beyond uh, the uh, the assurance part in all of these companies which i have worked for and a couple of other boards what internal audit brought to the table was that over a period of time they were able to give additional advice and insight i'm hesitating to use the word consultancy because i think consultancy has a much broader ramification but whether it was in microsoft whether it is in state bank of india or whether it is in tcs clothing which is on which i'm on the board of uh, we were able to create new processes and all those new processes had to be vetted by internal audit to ensure that we were doing it the right way so over a period of time they actually also provided those business advice how to solve the problem not just that this is the problem so i think it's important that we look at internal audit just not just providing objective assurance independent assurance but also being able to provide insights which otherwise uh, we would have missed and i think you know we need to look at the at every organization in the um in the perspective of com competition and in the perspective of stakeholders demand and i think internal audit is playing a role in ensuring that both of those criteria are taken into account uh, so that the organization becomes much more effective so i'll stop here and if there's any further uh you know questions you have about the role 
and I'd be happy to share my experience. No, no, thank you so much. Uh, but before I move to the next question, I would certainly like to remember an incident. I think almost eight to 10 years ago, we had a gentleman called Rod Winters, who I think was the CFO of Microsoft globally. And uh, I heard him at the Radisson Hotel and he said something very interesting. He says internal audit is tasked with organizing the strategy session for the company globally. And uh, that was something which was like music to our ears because even 10 years ago, when we were learning and hearing less about insights and foresights, uh, these guys were actually involved at the strategic stage also for the organization. But I guess we could come back to that later when I pose my next question uh, to Dr. Ashok Haldia. Uh, sir, uh, you know, you have uh, been across so many organizations, committees, chambers, etc. Uh, do you feel that internal audit has the stature, access, and independence to maximize its effectiveness and discharge its responsibilities? How can the board help internal audit in this particular area? Uh, over to you, sir, Dr. Haldia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kocher, for inviting me. Let me speak out of my experience beginning 30 years ago. When I tried to raise the level of internal audit in the government of Rajasthan for the state level public enterprises. And then later on, moving to ICAI, global international forums, and then adding myself an organization and interacting the internal audit and trying to raise the standards of internal audit. The question of stature of internal audit is linked to is that the stature today that they, that they enjoy? is befitting of the responsibility that they are expected to carry, the role they are expected to play. And for that matter, do they enjoy the level that they would be able to effectively discharge their, their, their role and responsibility? My answer to, the, to this is unfortunately no. Now, having said that, having said that, uh, we should be happy that the, that the internal auditors traveled from what we used to consider in the role in the in the routine and the you know the rudimentary and as a necessary ritual to a larger role in the areas of the governance control and the compliance it has a greater recognition in the, the law in terms of the companies act and in terms of the uh, you know lodr of sebi and also the management as uh, mr mr Baskar said the management have also have increased realization of the role that the internal audit, independent and objective internal audit can play in enhancing the effectiveness of the organization and the and the board, board functioning. But let me tell you on the whole, leaving aside some companies and in some limited respect, uh, this is not enough. Possibly much more needs to be done. Take an example, though there is a there is a section 138 introduced into the Companies Act. Uh, which 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 have virtually required the companies uh, to appoint an internal auditor, but at the same time, it says that the scope, functions, the approach, and the methodology has to be decided by the board. And and this is to be right with the regulation number eighteen of LODR in consultation with the with the audit committees. Now, so the scope has to be determined by the audit committee and the board. It presupposes that you have the board members who understand what internal audit is, who appreciate the role and significance in enhancing the effectiveness of the board and also of the organization. I would, based on my assessment, my understanding of interacting at different levels, largely, I'm not, I'm not saying in totality, largely, my answer is no, that realization is not there at the board level. The another aspect is that the internal audit have themselves have to be rise to, uh, to raise themselves to the level that they are able to project how important, how significant they are to the board and to the organization, because because their scope has to be determined by the audit committee in consultation with the internal auditor. Now it would mean that the internal auditor should have the capacity and the competence to impress upon the intern to the audit committee what they what they should be doing, what they can do, and what they ought to be doing. And, and, and also what they are capable of de delivering, they should be able to convince the board and then they should deliver and also add value to the board and also aligning their internal audit and internal audit plan to the strategic, ob strategic objective of the organization. And also, unless they are able to do that, they are 
able to demonstrate their utility uh, to the board and to the audit committee to the stakeholders, despite the recognition given by the law, I would believe this stature in effect uh, would not be there. Now, it should not be the case. You know, I, 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 I was hearing an internal auditor of a large company which collapsed a couple of years ago. And when he was asked as to, did you, did you look into the veracity of the cash and bank balances? And his response was that, look, that was not the mandate given by me, given to me by the audit committee, because the scope didn't say that I am, I'm expected to look into the cash and bank balance transactions. Now that's the point that I'm trying to say. And remember, here was the audit committee, which had the distinguished persons with a, with a, I mean, with a distinguished background in the management and the finance. And I'm sure the internal auditor had also an adequate experience and background. So the point I'm trying to say is that 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 it's it, if the stature has to be lay, uh, raised, the law has to recognize, and then the profession itself has to rise to the level. So the there has to be reform in the law. There has to be reform in the profession. There has to be reform at the company level as far as the internal audit is concerned, and also at the in at the you know. Uh, the individual internal audit firm level. Now, Professor, uh, sorry, Mr. Mr. Bhaskar talked about the State Bank of India. Now, I would believe, you know, the internal audit has to be agile. agile. It, they have to transform their role according to the changing needs of the society, and they have to be proactive and dynamic. I would believe, having a background of the financial institution, I would believe that as an internal auditor, now they they they, they could have been more proactive in looking at the quality of portfolio, the liquidity problem, and also projecting the future shock, the future scenario in which the banks and the NBFCs might lend themselves into if they do not take the corrective risks that was embedded in the environment, risks that was embedded into their management practices, system, and the processes. If they would have highlighted, they would have raised to the board. I am sure no audit committee, no board member, what it is, and independent directors would ignore their advice and would, I mean, would have ignored um, their, their advice to that extent. Now, if what is responsible for the stature of the, uh, you know, the internal audit, apart from why, what I have stated, I would also say a uh, possibly a fee, and to that extent, an internal audit profession would have to be responsible in themselves. I feel that it is a subservient, it is secondary to the statutory audit. Now, look, these are two different targets. The approach is different, mindset is required to be different, their scope is different, their role and contribution uh, to the stakeholders are different. Now, now that, that has to be projected to the management, because what is happening is, in most of the companies, the, uh, and, and so the, the Regulation 13 of the LODR would, uh, would, would, uh, would possibly, uh, 18, sorry, Regulation 18 would require that their role is basically financial reporting and the safeguarding of the assets. And or maybe in terms of effectiveness and the, you know the uh, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. They, if 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 they need to extend that role, then they have to project that it's not. They are not simply finance and account person. They have a larger role in risk. They are in 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 technology, in data science, in data analytics, in cybersecurity, and business continuity, and and and, and so on and so forth. So I would say that the over the years. The dynamics have changed. The internal audit has gained momentum. Possibly, they have moved. They have moved uh, many steps forward towards the uh, towards the rise the stature that we should have at the board level. But I would I would say possibly it is still not enough and not much more need to be done. Your question of independence and 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 also the access are very important. But I would, would I would believe. Uh, I, I will leave it to uh, you know uh, to some time later. But let me answer one question: If there is a doubt on the independence of the statutory auditor who is appointed by the AG, by by the general, by the shareholders, uh, and who enjoy a larger freedom and under the law and the authority and empowerment under the law, if there are doubts on the independence of internal auditor, one can imply about what would be the state of independence of the internal audit and the internal auditor. I would leave it that there are many, there are, there are large number of questions around around the independence and how to ensure the independence of internal auditors. Maybe sometime later, otherwise it would be going too long. Uh, I, um, maybe I would reflect about. It. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your views. Uh, but uh, before before I say anything about that, could I request Satish to put in the poll question which we have? Uh, Satish uh, request you to please pose uh, the poll question to all the participants. Uh, certainly very interesting to hear your views, Dr. Haldia. I think you have indicated, uh, you know, if I if I may uh, carry on talking while people are filling up the poll, that uh, there is actually a need for all the stakeholders involved in internal audit to up their game, uh, regardless of whether it is the audit committee, uh, whether it is the management, whether it is the internal audit profession, or it is the regulators, if I've understood you right. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, one thing which, uh, you know, which even we from the Institute of Internal Auditors uh, feel very strongly about is that a person with a CIA certification is nowhere mentioned as being qualified to conduct an internal audit uh, in under the Companies Act, Section 138, as you were talking about. And, uh, you know, this is the most widely globally recognized uh, degree uh, across the world as far as internal audit is concerned. So I do hope we have, uh, you know, some someone from the regulatory side also listening in on this. But in the meanwhile, Satish, uh, do we have uh, do we have responses coming in to the poll question which you have asked that how would you rank your internal audit function in being truly independent and equipped to meet the expectations of the board? Or uh, do you have a similar opinion uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Haldia who set the cat amongst the pigeons? Or uh, do you feel that no, we really do have a fair amount of independence? So, uh, well, it does appear that uh, the audience uh, does seem to feel in a majority that they are halfway home and a fairly decent chunk feels that they are fairly well organized in terms of uh, getting a four. So we have 63%, uh, which is, I think, definitely the majority. And some people even saying E, so uh, happy to note, uh, because uh, certainly I think the kind of remarks which you made uh, were a cause of worry, but I don't think that we should stop asking those questions of ourselves. They remain valid, but happy to note that at least from the audience do feel that, uh, you know, a majority of us uh, in the internal audit function are truly independent and equipped. So uh, happy to hear that, but let me move on because uh, we already uh, half an hour into our session. Uh, my next question is posed to Mr. Mukundan. Uh, sir, as a CEO, you would like to ensure that the internal audit report carries a management perspective on, on all reported issues. Do you feel this in any way poses a dilemma as it may result in diluting the observations uh, presented to the audit committee. Over to you, Mr. Mukanda. So, thank you, Nikhil. I think uh, we've been given an excellent perspective by Baskar and Mr. Haldia, actually, in terms of what internal audit is supposed to do. Uh, and I think, uh, firstly, before I proceed, I hope all the entire audience is safe and well, and I wish them well in terms of the current pandemic. So, I think that's something which I would like to do. So, thank in you. terms of uh, the uh, broad issue which you have highlighted about, uh, you know, uh, the role of internal audit and the relationship of the management and the board. I think it all starts with one word called trust. I think if the environment of trust is not there, I think you can have very complicated relationship all the way through. And the second thing which uh, we always say, and I think one of my senior Tata director used to told me that we are trying to solve the problems of the world using Niti, but the problem is Niyat. <laughs> so, fundamentally, you, know, you can put as many rules, as many regulations, as many LODRs as possible, but there's a limit to what we can do. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what is the environment an organization has got? What is the level of trust you've built? And uh, what, and finally, also, Baskar also highlighted this whole issue of how do you elevate a role of a function to be a partner in progress rather than a cog in the wheel? And I think that takes a lot of uh, uh, work and i can tell you when we started internal audit function with all its earnestness in terms of implementing it the way the uh, company law states about 15 or 17 years ago in the company uh, and i was actually running a plant and i can tell you my view was how how do these guys know anything about my operations <laughs> natural response at that point of time the uh, the second shocking point which was there when i when i first entered the boardroom and we had new, newly appointed an independent director he came from government and his first question was internal audit 
uh, function and do you have a separate vigilance function? So we have to explain to him there's nothing called vigilance function in private sector. We don't have such function. So it all boils down to the fact that what kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, let's say, relationship one builds. What we've done over the period within, uh, I can speak about my company and my experience is that we have, we have over a period of time continued to strengthen this function because we see this as a very critical piece in delivering value to our stakeholders. It is a very important function and uh, certainly uh, it's part of the management team and uh, uh, but we've created certain nuances in the sense that uh, the goal setting, the performance setting is not just with the CEO of the company, it's actually the audit committee chairman. So that there is a bit of a separation, there's a bit of a uh, uh, sort of oversight of this function. The person also has independent meetings with the audit committee without the management being present so that wow. they can, uh, he can speak his mind if there is something which is troubling him. And we view these as not as a tool which will undermine the management, but will also bring out nuances which may be missing, which we may want to know. And uh, one of the big shifts which happened about four years or three or four years ago in the company is to define certain layers of defense which we will put in within the company. The first layer of defense we actually defined as business assurance, and that was moved away from audit function. So the way we said was the assurance must be led by the management team itself. So I fully agree what the speakers have said before me, you know, the big component of internal audit is going to be assurance is also going to be assessment is also advisory. I mean, the three A's which go with the internal audit, which is the, really the key, key role. But we said the first line of defense must be the management team itself so that when the internal auditor comes, he's able to add value. He's able to do an assessment and advise the team on what he, what they can do better. So we are constantly trying to move the needle in that direction. How successful we are, I can't say we are for sure very successful. Uh, if every now and then we have you know uh, uh, issues which crop up which uh, which make us to go in and uh, fix the system. Uh, we do conduct forensic audit, we do conduct statutory audit and all these audits do uh, add a layer of protection to the company. And if we say, listen, uh, are you a company where you've not discovered things have not gone wrong? We have discovered things have gone wrong. And they do come in from time to time. Uh, but it's good that we have the system in place, which allows us an early warning system so that it doesn't become a big issue in the long run. So uh, clearly, uh, if my, my own take of this question is that uh, uh, audit is uh, a partner in progress within the management team. And we view them as a key part of the progress which the company needs to make. Uh, they have a key role in the risk management. They have a key role in identifying what are the capability gaps which the company has got. Uh, they have a key role in ensuring that the company is able to deliver on it uh, on its uh, on its uh, performance, which has been committed to various stakeholders. So, but we have over a period of time. Uh, uh, have had an internal audit, which is given completely driven completely by internal teams. We also had an internal audit run completely by external team. Now we have reached the balance that you need both because there is a plus and minus. So we do work with internal, internal and internal, external. So uh, it's, it's always a fine balance at the end of the day. We also find the reaction of an internal audit uh, report by a new business is very different from one which is very mature. So I think the internal audit teams have also sort of started to fine tune that approach to say that you can't have one size fits all in terms of approaches, uh, depending on the maturity of the business uh, and the guardrails which you put in for any business to run sandbox within which they play, I think keeps changing depend, depending on wh what state of the business it is in. So uh, it, it, it is, it is uh, what I would call uh, test, improve, test and improve. I think we've got to constantly go through this cycle of test and improve to arrive at the golden mean. But clearly from that 15, 20 years ago, if I look at what internal audit was to where it is today, it has a much bigger role in value creation of the company. Uh, these guys really know what things will add value. In fact, uh, we have deployed the more recently in this pandemic when we wanted to look at what are the cost opportunities companies may have. My first port of call was to internal audit. I called them up and I said, listen, guys, can you put a small team and lead and let me know what things we can fix? And that tells you, uh, and immediately everybody congealed around that and worked with the internal audit team to come up with ideas which could uh, 
reduce the cost, which could keep the company's cash position safe. Uh, so uh, we, have, we are increasingly relying on this team, and uh, it's only uh, a matter that as the internal auditors evolve through delivery of outcomes, they will gain far greater respect within the board and the management to play a more uh, value-adding role than what they've been playing. But there are two, three elements I think we, we have to do, which I think have been missing in the past. One is getting the best talent into inter internal audit. Uh, uh, one of our subsidiary CEO actually ran internal audit function for us. So we found uh, internal audit to be a good uh, ground wherein you can actually grow talent. I think that is something which managements must realize. The second element is access to latest technology do you give them access to latest tools and do you allow them to benchmark with other companies which are doing well i think these are the two elements which i would say sort of uh, allow you to create value so we constantly worry about both we constantly worry about are we rotating our best talent through internal audit and are they coming out and are they getting right roles suppose someone wants to stay in internal audit we let him stay but i think we do want to rotate and secondly are they getting access to the right technology and right tools available in this age of digitization? I think uh, that is far more uh, productive and far more meaningful for all of you. I'll stop here. Uh, and th those are my initial views. No, no, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mukundan. I uh, really found uh, refreshing uh, your initial emphasis on the fact of values, uh, you know, which I think uh, is something the Tata Group per se stands for. Uh, you spoke about the importance of trust and Niti versus Niyat. Uh, I think that is very critical. You also spoke about a difference as an approach based on the evolutionary stage uh, of the maturity of the organization. So uh, I think uh, all of them extremely valid points, uh, the fact that you have to uh, make them partners in uh, progress, trust them and provide them uh, with the tools and technologies as well as uh, the right uh, mix of competence. Uh, because, you know, I guess they can't all be chartered accountants. You, you may need people who are specialized in IT. Uh, we may need, uh, you know, uh, engineers like yourself uh, who would be a huge value add, et cetera, et cetera. We ourselves have used civil engineers for structural yeah, audits. Nikhil, just to say, one of our best internal audit head has been an engineer so. lovely I, I i really appreciate that wonderful to hear that and it strikes a chord with me also so thank you so much uh, i will uh, move on to our next question which would be based uh, and forwarded towards uh, mr bhaskar pramanik uh, mr pramanik do you feel that internal audit provides adequate attention to strategic risks and is it equipped to look at such risks uh, from a competence perspective because this is something which I had also kind of alluded to uh, when, uh, you know, I was uh, talking about your remarks, but over to you, sir. Look forward to your comments. Uh, sir, I think you're on mute, please. Sorry. Thank you. I just unmuted. So it's actually, a, you know, a function of the maturity of the organization. And uh, again, I will go back to the State Bank of India, which has a separate risk organization the cro also reports into the audit committee as does the internal audit and you know taking off from where um, uh, mukundan was sharing what the uh, the structure in uh, um, and the philosophy of internal audit and tata chemicals sbi is exactly the same philosophy basically the first line of defense is the operations people so therefore, you know, the success and failure of risk management, governance, uh, internal controls, it is the responsibility of the operational people. You can't say that, you know, somebody is watching behind your back and then we'll catch you if you do something wrong. They are the first line of defense and they have to understand that. And in Microsoft, that's what I meant was a cultural transition. The people realized that they were responsible for those outcomes and that if they had any challenges or any queries, they would raise and escalate it. It was not that somebody was always over, you know, looking over their shoulders. The second line of defense in the case of SBI are the business functions, which includes a risk. So risk, credit, HR, uh, IT. These are the people who make the policies, how certain things needs to be done. What are the people and processes and the system which will bring about those, uh, uh, the, the, those governance and management and the internal controls and that which the operation people have to follow. 
And then it is the role of the internal audit to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do. And that's when they lay out the whole internal audit process. So I just want to be very clear. And again, everything is based upon trust. The success of the failure of a company, you cannot say it was because of internal audit. Right? They may be part of the cause, but the bigger cause most cases, whether it's external or internal, is actually poor governance, which starts with the board as well as the CEO of, uh, or the chairman of the company. It starts with that. And then you have all these other areas where there could have been certain lapses. But very clearly, the primary responsibility is, is one of the, uh, the, the board uh, and the lack of governance. Now, when we come to strategic risk, risks are constantly in a, and something like the SBI, the risks are constantly being evaluated in terms of, because it's a very changing dynamic situation. Um, you know, Mr. Haldia talked about, you know, the, the stresses in different industry sectors. Uh, in the last few years, which I've been on the board of SBI, we first had the steel industry going through tremendous turmoil. And those stress there was primarily because of commodity prices, overproduction, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, there were various different manufacturers who had made the investments. And for whatever reasons, they were not getting the kind of returns and they were not able to return back. But then you had the power sector. The power sector stresses were there for a variety of different reasons, both on the supply side, also on the demand side, non-payment of, uh, of bills. Uh, you know, strategic supplies which uh, sort of worked out. Suddenly, the coal mine, the whole thing was thrown out of. So there was some policy-related issue. Now it is very difficult when you talk about strategy to go beyond a period of a couple of years, and therefore you have to constantly keep looking at what are the stresses in different sectors. Same thing with construction. So I think in the case of SBI, it is the uh, strategic all the risks is actually done at the level of the, uh, of the uh, chief risk officer, his organization, and presented to the board and the, through the audit committee and the risk management committee to finally arrive at what are the areas which needs to be focused on, and then what would be the processes which you would follow, internal control processes, governance processes, and then it is internal audit which then puts their audit plan together. In the case of uh, SBI, the internal audit starts off with a policy document, which is revised once a year, depending on the changing circumstances. Then it comes out with an audit plan, which is approved by the audit committee, which is then approved by the board and which they go out and execute. And then they come back with the quarterly outcomes of each of the audit, uh, uh, which they do, which they then share with, again, the ACB and also with the board. So it's a very well chosen process. Uh, given the challenges, uh, uh, you know, and you know, emerging challenges which are there, like COVID and everything else, I think the uh, what ha I have seen the ingenuity of the uh, of audit internal audit team. So, for example, in a bank like uh, SBI, where you have close to about twenty five thousand branches, how do you do audits when you have situation where you can't even get there? As it is, it was difficult for the uh, external policies to be closing this year. So it was actually uh, by about a month. But think about internal audit where you have to check the operations, manage operation risk, the credit risk, uh, the FEMA uh, risk uh, for each one of the branches. So they have actually automated the whole thing and they've created a system called radar where they can actually pick up all the different inputs and do the analysis from a central location, which is, for, which is in Hyderabad. Uh, in the case of SBI, they're also using technology and they're using algorithms to identify certain sequence of, you know, transactions, certain transactions, which if they fulfill some 65 different criteria, then they would actually examine those transactions with far greater detail. So imagine a bank with the size of SBI, where this huge number of transactions taking place, they're actually using these filters, algorithms, AI, whatever you want to call it, to actually identify those specific kinds of transactions. So to just to uh, you know, cut short my uh, answer to your simple question, uh, strategic risk in an organization like SBI is done by a completely different department. It is the responsibility of internal audit to play a role, but it is primarily on a supportive, but in terms of actually checking whether those uh, processes, those controls are in place, 
That's their primary job. And they're using technology a lot more to be able to make that happen. In a smaller organization like in the Microsoft, where we did not have a risk organization, and frankly, uh, you know, I've learned a lot about risk and how to manage it in the bank than I ever did in the private sector. So, you know, our, the concept of risk in a, uh, in, a, in a private sector, especially in a multinational, was very, very uh, limited and very focused. Uh, but in the case of a bank, it is much more wider, and therefore they are specialists to do that. So my view is that risk is a specialized task. It should be left to the specialist, and it is the role of uh, internal audit to basically ensure that whatever uh, the risk management team is proposing is actually being executed in the right way. And again, they can give certain suggestions and recommendations depending on the kind of results which we are seeing so that it can be continuously fine-tuned and monitored. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pramanik. Uh, I think your speaking about the three lines of defense uh, would have been, uh, you know, like music to the ears of most uh, world uh, internal auditors. Uh, it's, a, it's a model which many of us have been following for many years. And certainly uh, that model also advocates the fact that uh, the second line of defense would perhaps be the risk assurance, whereas uh, internal audit would be the third line of defense, which would evaluate uh, how effectively management as well as the second line of uh, defense are functioning. So uh, I think uh, absolutely bang on and uh, wonderful to hear that from you. If I may carry on to my next question, uh, which will be directed to Dr. Ashok Haldia. Uh, Dr. Haldia, there is a recent discussion paper of RBI on corporate governance for banks uh, that recommends that audit committee meetings should be held without the presence of management executives. Uh, a lot of literature from the IIA also recommends that they should be a one-to-one -one between either the audit committee chair or the audit committee board uh, and the internal auditors without the presence of management. So, uh, do you feel that such uh, recommendations or practices can change the role of the relationship between audit committee and internal audit? Uh, since we are running along on time, may I request that we could, you know, keep our answers to within about two to three minutes so that later on we can get a greater chance for uh, the poll questions to be answered. Over to you, Dr. Haldia, please. Uh, uh, you know, Mr. Kocher. Uh, the, in, the audit committee able to perform its role effectively uh, without having a viewpoint of the management is difficult to visualize. Audit committee is the persons, which is comprised of the persons uh, who knows their job, expected to know their job very well. And therefore, when they, when, 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 when some report comes to for them, they are expected to form some view. It would not be practical, logical to frame that view without without talking to the management. So to me, talking to the management is very important. Secondly, as far as the internal auditor is concerned, internal auditor, the audit committee has to talk to, to, to the internal auditor because without talking to the internal auditor, the scope cannot be finalized. The audit plan cannot be finalized. The evaluation of the internal auditor performance cannot take place. So the talking to the internal auditor is very important. It is not only is talk to the important, but the chairman of the audit committee and to me, the chairman of the board should have formal and informal interaction uh, with the internal auditor. There should be in-camera meeting with, 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 uh, between the audit committee and the auditor alone, so that the auditor is able to you know, point out the independence issue, the objectivity issues, some of the critical issues which he cannot make uh, you know, in the audit committee or in the board, which he may like to share formally or informally with the audit committee. Uh, audit committee. Absolutely. Uh, look, right. while, while, we, uh, while we took a poll, I'll take a couple of minutes while we took a poll and we more, most of them were happy with independence. You, you have to draw independence from the structure that the law provides to you and the management have a trust and believe in you. It cannot be that you are independent. So far, you are not uncomfortable to me. Right. Independence, right. Come, uh, independence come at the cutting edge. Now, with the internal auditor have the cutting edge, that's the point. Because there is a mix of audit function, there is a mix of assurance function, there is a mix of advisory, there is a mix of consulting. Now, what we are talking of independence, true independence is when it comes to the audit and assurance. And what the what, what Mr. Bhaskar and Mr. Mukandan said, a cog in the wheel or partnership in the value. To me, uh, to me, he has to be partnership in the value creation, at the same time being objective, independent, and a positive 
criticism or, or you know positive reaction to the operational performance that's what has to be mindset of the internal auditor now constructive that, criticism yeah yeah that's very that, and for that independence is very important i would go a step further all board in, in, in all the board meetings where the strategic and the risk aspects and the critical aspects are being discussed, the internal auditor should always remain in attendance because he can add his, you know, what, what, what Mr. Mukundan said, the larger role that the internal auditor is playing at the board meeting in those critical items, the internal auditor can play a very, very critical and the, and, 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 you know, the important role. So I would believe, and the internal auditor is very important because part of his job related to the risk you cannot visualize a risk committee meeting without an internal auditor now for the banks the rbi has provided for the it committees now i would be it would be difficult for me to visualize holding an audit committee meeting without an internal auditor now whenever i did conduct these meetings in my organization and i encouraged the audit committee and the board that 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 you must have an internal auditor present before you because the board and the audit committee must ask the internal auditor the question do you have anything to say which you are not given in your report now, audit committee may ask the internal auditor in person, may ask separately in an in-camera meeting. But that question is very important to me to be asked to the internal auditor. Because if the internal auditor doesn't do, remember, the statutory auditor is relying upon the work of internal auditor. And he is the interface between the company and the external stakeholder. So if he's not independent, the internal auditor is not independent, the statutory auditor works, the quality of that would also be greatly affected. So I would believe the value to the board would be more when the when 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 he is a true as you said in the beginning ear eyes and uh, you know the hand of the board and the board members thank you right right no, no. thank you so much for your response uh, you know very often uh, us internal auditors have felt that you walk into an audit committee and the audit committee instructs you okay you got three reports can we just finish them off in 10 minutes or 15 minutes because we have very little time the agenda is too busy now uh, where is there going to be a one to one unless there is separate time which is provided to the internal auditors to have to one to one uh, in the absence of management personnel so that they can be a free and frank discussion uh, so, you know, Mr. Are, are... Mr. It's, it's important for a minute because it's not the question of what the audit committee is saying 10 minutes time because the audit committee members are not aware of importance of internal audit they are not aware right. of that, right. that right. it's right. desirable right. necessary for them to to devote sufficient time with the internal auditor. Yeah. So, so in these the cases, members, it's a problem for the with, the with the board members, their lack of orientation, understanding, and exposure to the realities of internal audit. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move now to the next question. Uh, back to uh, Mr. Pramanik. Uh, do you feel, uh, Mr. Pramanik, that internal auditor can provide inputs to the board on matters like tone at the top? and culture of governance you know we talk a lot about audit of culture because uh, mr mukundan was talking about trust he was talking about niyat he was talking about niti uh, i think all these things uh, and definitely there's a lot of weightage given in the tata group uh, and you were saying uh, sbi is also somewhat similar uh, to values so uh, do you feel do you feel that internal auditors are actually competent enough to provide this kind of feedback uh, well over to you sir yeah, so again, I think it is a function of the leadership and the culture. If the, uh, you know, if the leadership, uh, whether it's management or whether it's the board, uh, is willing to listen, then I think that the inputs from uh, the uh, internal audit can be extremely valuable. So I have observed, for example, that when you get uh, an audit report and there are certain cases which are very persistent and you know consistent and that there's a pattern which emerges uh, it is possible for internal audit to actually indicate and suggest what could be the issues and that could result in some changes in terms of either the management uh, you know there's a for example in the case of uh, our sbi there's a, a system of rewards uh, and punishment or demerits, not punishment, but demerit in case a particular branch is consistently not showing uh, the right kind of uh, performance from an internal audit perspective. I think it's also a function of the uh, level at which the internal audit is in the organization. In the case of State Bank of India, the head of internal audit is at the level of a deputy managing director. So he is therefore very very senior level and on peer 
with everybody else, whether it is the risk management function, the CFO, whether it is the uh, HR function, he's at the same level. So therefore, you therefore hire or have people who have that kind of credibility and who have that kind of experience and backing to be able to uh, show that they can actually, uh, you know, contribute and add value. Uh, and more important, I think, you know, it, to get that culture across, it is really a function of leadership, both at the management level and at the board in terms of their own behaviors and therefore their support, which they provide to internal audit is reflected in their own behavior. So for example, if an internal audit is actually saying that this particular circle, there are certain weaknesses and the chairman of the bank actually goes to the circle mm -hmm. and has a discussion around that, that creates a culture where people understand the importance of some of these practices. So I think, you know, when you think about the culture of compliance and governance, that really is a leadership and a board responsibility where again, internal audit can give inputs. Right. So right. in the case of SBI, I'm again taking that example. It's at a very high level. He's a part of the audit committee. He's a part of the extended board meetings, and he's also a part of the risk management and committee. So therefore the head of internal audit is on. He's also part of the IT strategy committee. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. So let's also get the views of the audience on this because we have our next poll question, which is related. So let's see how much they are uh, in sync with uh, what Mr. Pramanik has to say uh, that uh, certainly the internal audit is capable of looking at uh, the culture and the tone at the top, provided it is given adequate independent uh, independence uh, status in the organization. And uh, it's led by someone who's senior enough to understand and be respected. Uh, so, uh, so could you please respond to this question? Does your organization's internal audit mandate cover matters like tone at the top and culture of governance? Uh, does internal audit provide inputs to the board on these matters? So uh, we'll keep this open for a minute. Uh, but uh, certainly, Mr. Pramanik, uh, it's wonderful to hear this from you that State Bank of India uh, does have such an emancipated culture. Uh, certainly, I think it would be very interesting for me, again, as a passionate internal auditor, to understand what are the participants' views on this particular one. I think this aspect of the survey uh, and this question is going to be, uh, you know, certainly important. So, uh, Satish, is it possible? We are already at 55 seconds of the poll question. I do hope we have a lot of uh, fastest fingers first who've gone ahead and clicked on whatever they felt was the right choice. Uh, so, can we hear the uh, can we hear the results of the poll now that we have uh, completed a minute, Satish? Okay. So uh, now over here, the question was that. Uh, if you feel that it is capable and yes, then the first answer is yes, second is no, third is sometimes, fourth is not aware. So we do have 35% saying sometimes, but you have a total of 53% saying, uh, sorry, 31% is saying yes and 22% is saying no. So certainly this is a case of a mixed bag, if I may say so where I do feel that internal auditors, uh, you know, we, we, what we have to maybe further investigate it, are they given the opportunity and B, are they competent to do so? But it does appear that there is a fair amount of ground to be covered over here. Uh, the next question is also linked to, uh, you know, is uh, forwarded towards Mr. Mukundan and it is linked to one of your favorite subjects since you spoke about technology. I'm sure that's an area Mr. Pramanik is also very comfortable with, both of you being from IIT, that there is a substantial discussion on the need for internal audit to transform in the digital age and use tools and technologies. If internal audit has to be more data and digital di driven, is it possible to have an in-house expertise or should be you looking at appropriate models of in-house 
co-sourced or outsourced? If I may add to this question, I think the current COVID environment, the need to work from home, the need to be able to audit uh, remotely uh, are all adding to the importance of this question. So we really look forward to hearing uh, your response, Mr. Mukundan, followed by a poll question on the same subject. So I think uh, we have uh, found uh, certainly on the second part of the question before going into technology, what is the right model, internal, external or co-sourced, co right. co-resourced model? I think we have come to the conclusion co-resourced model is very critical because you can't find all the capabilities internally or externally in one, one place or one uh, and what we have done is to sort of mix the mix and match depending on the situation, depending on the year, depending on what our policy at that point of time is, what our strategy at that point of time is, and that will work well for us. Uh, so the second is that how are we dealing with this whole COVID situation? I think uh, the fact that statutory audit finished faster than before, fact the fact that we did our AGM before what we did in the physical meeting time, and fact that we are also going to finish our quarter one uh, result announcement much faster than what we've done before tells you that the that the team, both uh, external statutory auditors, the operating team have actually pivoted very rapidly to digital. It has been one of the most pleasant surprise that all these tools existed, but we had great comfort in packing our suits and traveling. Uh, when it could have been done very differently, uh, remotely, and equally as effectively as uh, possible. And uh, the, the thing which blocks us from finishing audits or finishing these reports on time is the base documentation is not digitized. If we don't have the base documentation, everything moving to digital format, I think then to say do analytics digital is going to be extremely tough because it's lying in three, four different formats. So we have, uh, I think what this has proven to us is that the fact that we've taken the pain to digitize most of our base document, most of our foundational data sources, has led to the fact that it is uh, clearly helping us in the data analysis. However, having reached this stage, I want to tell you when we did data maturity assessment of our company and most companies on a scale of five, most of us were scoring close to two. Oh, so it is it is a it, it is a call to action for all of us. That two is just a starting point. You know, uh, we have to go to three and four. We know. But it is very important that you do a data as a maturity assessment, whether data is mature itself in your organization. Then you can build analytics on top of that. And there are very specific models and tools to do this. And I think there are companies from uh, the, uh, I would say, technology field which do this. I think I would encourage most uh, internal auditors to take this very seriously if they want to move in that uh, uh, direction. Now, with respect to the uh, technology adop adoption, as I've mentioned, I think uh, last three, four years, we've seen uh, terrific technology adoption. Uh, there are now, for example, for inventory take, what used to be done by physically someone going and measuring a heap. Today, they're being done by drones. I mean, that tells you the technology is not just IT, it is also other tools of visual technology, observational technology, which are coming into play. And all these technologies are helping internal audit to get to more accurate finding, more accurate recommendations to management, and more accurate root cause analysis of what to fix it. Or what are the pathways to improve the performance of the uh, company much better than before? So I would certainly say that, uh, that there's a suite of uh, tools which are available, and all these are available off the shelf. Uh, small companies, big companies can pick and choose what they want to do. Uh, and secondly, I think, uh, that there is a there is a realization within our team that while we need an internal champion to head internal audit, which means you need a functional head to head that function, the capabilities which you want to build within the company, there could be few and then other capabilities may have to be sourced from outside to be in a plug and play model, depending on what the outcomes the audit committee needs. That's the model we are settling in. No, no, thank you so much. I think uh, it's, it's, it's a realization which all internal auditors are today facing that in case they are not able to adopt and adapt with technology, 
and conduct remote audits. They're going to be out of business. So I think they really don't have a choice. Uh, but your other point about the fact that the base, uh, the documentation, the base documentation needs to be digitized is absolutely critical uh, for the audit to be more effective. So the point is extremely well taken. Uh, since we are already at uh, 11 minutes past five, uh, there is one question, uh, poll question, which is uh, related to this. Uh, so, uh, Satish, if we could uh, request you to please pose the question and let us see uh, what is what are the views of the professionals who are attending this. And uh, whilst this is happening, I think uh, definitely technology is absolutely critical. I'm sure in an organization uh, like yours, uh, with a with a IIT engineer heading the organization, I'm sure uh, you know technology would be definitely getting its uh, due importance, and you must be evalu evaluating uh, all possible options also in that regard. So whilst we listen to this, uh, I take the liberty of jumping across. Uh, there is a common question which I have, uh, which is going to be posed to all the panelists. And uh, maybe we could start uh, with uh, Mr. Bhaskar, followed by Dr. Haldia, and then finally back to you, although you already partially covered this. that. Uh, Whilst you can mull this over, we'll uh, talk about what are the results of this particular this thing. Has the internal audit function helped uh, in your view of you three panelists help reassess your risks, controls, and processes in the COVID environment? Uh, did they support your business adequately or not? Uh, because I do remember seeing, uh, you know, there was there was a survey done by the IIA uh, in North America, and within the first three weeks. Uh, about 70 or 80 percent of internal auditors had already assisted their organizations to reevaluate the risk. But we'll come back to that later. Uh, let us see what do we have. The specific question is how do you rate your internal audit organization in terms of digital adoption uh, with from initial to A being initial and E being optimized? I think most of them do feel like you said, uh, Mr. Mukundan, they're at stage two or stage three, which is defined. So certainly this is an area where we need to, need to do a lot more. Uh, but at the same time, fortunately, we are not at base level. Uh, we have gone uh, beyond that. So uh, so back, uh, back to Mr. Pramanik. Uh, sir, uh, do you feel that the internal audit function has helped in reassessing your risk controls and processes in the COVID environment? Your views on that, please, uh, Mr. Pramanik. Uh, two minutes, if you don't mind, uh, you know, we must leave some time for the questions and Mr. Mukandan has a hard stop if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, Nikhil, don't don't get pressured by that. I've already moved it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Much appreciated, sir. Uh, Mr. Pramanik, I think you are uh, muted again. So uh, looking forward to listen to you, sir. Okay, so my answer to that question is very simple. I think uh, there has been considerable recommendations given by the internal audit teams of a number of different boards where I am, but that's primarily been focused on the maintenance or the business continuity. It has not really focused on what could be the emerging issues um, uh, uh, because of an extended business lockdown. I think it's really been focused on how do we continue to maintain our current operations safely and securely uh, with the least amount of risk. But I think Fair that enough. the next phase, which is basically if it's extended or if there is a recovery, then what things need to change, that I think is still under discussion and is under, I would say, more discovery than I think investigation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Haldia, what are your views on this? Uh, do you feel the IA function has helped to reassess risk controls and processes in the COVID environment, sir? Certainly. Uh, one thing is that uh, from growth to survival to uh, growth and sustainable to survival, now different organizations are working on these models post COVID. So growth forget about then sustainable survival. And who can be the better place than the internal audit? Because the internal audit has an you know, enterprise wide inside and inside and foresight, all, all the three that they, that they pointed out in the beginning. So that they are the best place. Second thing is, as you move, your, your, your work environment change from you know, work from home, work, work from home, it poses a lot many questions in terms of employability, in terms of IT system, in terms of data security, network security, and certainly the, you know, the internal audit is better place. And thirdly, is the risk around the contracts 
the risk around the you know the physical facilities within the company all that risk are of paramount importance and i internal audit is day in day out are dealing with those documents those papers and they are well conversant with as to where the risk are hidden and what could be manifestation of manifestation implications of that those risks for the organization to me they are better place and they have certainly been uh, taken recourse to by the management as a you know as a as a as a, as a you know first uh, stop to advise them and guide them Uh, thank you so much, sir. And back to you, uh, Mr. Makandan. Uh, what are your views? Uh, so on, this, on I, I, I would not place this at the door of the internal audit. I would place it at the door of the entire team, which is the board, the management, the uh, various functions, including internal audit. I think uh, the, the the speed and agility of response by all of them uh, in the initial phase, which was to basically can we at least uh, uh, hold our ground. shutdown happened i think was very very agile very fast very responsive and as baskar said was very very insightful and a lot of uh, support came from internal audit team the second one which we are going through which is to reopen which is to slowly reopen our operations and build the uh, uh, sales and revenue going forward i think uh, internal audit is certainly playing a role but what is uh, really something which we need to imagine together is how will this play out i think that discussion has not started in its earnestness because uh, there are really two three four scenarios which it could play out that this is really a long haul of two years or this is uh, you know a short one which finishes in 6 to 8 months i think there are uh, maybe it's even 3 years let us say then i think companies have to play out scenario management have to think through and uh, if you say that has anyone projected with all seriousness anything beyond a year i would say that even we most of us haven't and uh, it is it is really not at the doorstep of the internal audit the management have to start to think about as we learn more about this health problem uh, how do we prepare our organization our employees our stakeholders and what risk does this pose if this is a really a long haul and i think uh, i hope it is not Uh, but i am very sure of one thing that internal audit will have various insights to provide whatever may be the scenario i think they will be a key player in that decision making because they certainly know the weak points and the strong points of the organization they are better placed to advise as an insider uh, to the management team as to which pivots we must and which fulcrums we must use to pay our way out of this whole uh, situation we are in and the second issue is that this situation is not a situation of a company i think one of the things internal audit needs to think beyond is this is a situation of a ecosystem how many of the internal auditors and i'm posing this not just internal but the entire functions in the management team itself can they think in the in 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 terms of ecosystem rather than in the in in terms of just the company itself can the boards think in terms of ecosystem is going to be a big question going forward i'm very sure that people are now beginning to talk about that and uh, we will have conversations around it but very clearly internal audit has a key role to play now uh, thank you so much uh, i think uh, you know i i fully resonate with what you're saying that management does have to own the risks but at the same time internal audit can help in uh, identifying uh, or assessing a lot of the risks or to see whether the management is doing it in the right manner because let's face it many of us when we looked at uh, business continuity planning were looking at things like earthquakes and fires who had thought of a virus so as a matter of fact i think a lot of risks have come to the fore which were never considered earlier and uh, you know i had done a scenario planning for one organization where we were talking of 3 months 6 months and maybe 12 to 15 months 3 to 6 uh, or sorry 3 months 6 to 9 months and 12 to 15 months and 3 uh, months has just gone out of the window because 3 months are already over and there's no end in sight it's still increasing so these are all i think uh, relevant points uh, for us internal auditors to mull over uh, happy to see and hear that all of you agree that we can play a role we can add value and i certainly hope that all the participants who are involved in internal audit and risk management are trying to do their bit uh, so we've been uh, you know i think we've not been very fair to the audience uh, we've been enjoying your insight so much that we've kept on chatting uh, perhaps uh, satish or nirmalya in case you would like to share with us some of the q and a's which have been posed please feel free to direct them to who you feel uh, would answer and uh, you know request the panelists to add any view points in case it's not directed to them uh, over to you please uh, if you would just ask some of the questions which have been flowing in thank you 
Michael, uh, thank you. Puneet will take it over. Yes, please. Fine. So thanks, uh, everybody, for all your insights. I think it has been an interesting uh, session. Uh, uh, I will, uh, given the time that we have, I will be able to take only a few questions. There were a lot of questions that were asked uh, uh, during the discussion. Uh, one common theme which seems to be continuing is uh, on the independence of internal order, uh, auditor and uh, the uh, competency and the stature that they, uh, they enjoy in the organization to discharge their responsibility. That uh, seems to be a big theme. Uh, the key question that I would like to ask is that if internal auditor is truly independent uh, and clear, then why do we see so many frauds uh, in the country? And uh, what can the internal auditor do to really uh, help the board in ensuring uh, that there are adequate uh, 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 controls? Uh, so, yeah, uh, maybe I would uh, like uh, Dr. Haldia to take this and uh, other panelists, uh, please feel free to add. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Puneet. Uh, as I stated in the beginning, my understanding of the statutory independence of the profession is different than the, what, the, what the board would suggest. So I would believe a uh, lot needs to be done to raise their stature in companies in general. I'm not talking about the few companies which are the iconic companies and where the, where the management is forward-looking, progressive, enlightened management. So I leave that aside. I'm talking about the common mass. Uh, so I believe a lot needs to be done. You need to change the legal framework. As uh, you know, we, we, uh, we are seeing the scope of internal audit is dynamic, is changing, is evolving constantly. There has to be some permanent, you know, some, some static portion of the internal audit that should be embedded in the law in terms of the scope. And that should not leave in the limits and fences of the management of the, the audit committee. I gave you one example of a, of, of a very large company, company collapse in India and what the internal audit and audit committee felt about the scope of the internal audit. So that's the one thing. Second thing is that the internal, the audit committee reviews the, reviews the performance of internal auditor together with the management. The management need not be present when the internal audit performance is being reviewed. So that's, the, that's the second thing that I, mean, that I would say. Third is the remuneration part of it. You have to make the remuneration attractive so that the quality of quality of audit comes in. Now, when I'm saying attractive, you, you cannot an independent mechanism, but there are matrices and you know the process is available to see whether the whether uh, the remuneration is commensurate with the responsibility that the internal auditor is, 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 is expected to perform. There are various ways globally which are being uh, which, which are being followed. Now your question that why despite the internal auditor the the fraud take place now First thing is the internal audit is, is, is not a forensic audit. They need to move towards. I think the time has come because world at last feel if you if you're not supposed to unravel the fraud, then what for the statutory audit and internal audit is stop it. Don't I mean don't do internal audit and statutory audit. So the, to me, the scope of the internal audit has to extend uh, to to you know unearthing the frauds, even if we say the, the internal audit is not you know is not a forensic audit. We need to see as to what way the role of internal audit can be expanded. The another thing is that I would still believe the administratively the internal audit in many cases, uh, you know, the internal audit is reporting to the management. I would say no, they to be totally dealing with the management. They should be reporting to the audit committee. Uh, the both in terms of the scope, in terms of the resources, in terms of you know strengthening the internal audit department. And also, in terms of uh, the, uh, the uh, their evaluation of the management, or also reporting on the investigation, which relates to the senior and the top management. I'm not saying that the, that the internal audit has to be, uh, you know, vindictive in all the process. Internal audit is different than the statutory audit. He has to have a different mindset, and we need to see that the internal auditor change their mindset. I, I, I mean, leaving aside few internal audit firms in India, few internal auditors in India. I don't think. The mindset of the internal auditor is attuned to the requirements of the internal audit. Uh, so, pointing to your question, the, mm -hmm. the, my, my response is that the scope of the internal audit and the tools and techniques of the internal audit needs to address as to what way they can they can fortify emergence of the fraud first, taking place of the fraud, and if fraud takes place, how they can be brought to the notice of the stakeholders. Particularly when the top management is part of that 
fraud. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, great uh, points, uh, Dr. Haldi. I think a uh, lot more deliberation needs to happen on uh, these points. Uh, but uh, I'll just take one more uh, question, uh, Nikhil, then advise uh, for, for how long we should uh, continue. I see a lot of participants uh, dropping off uh, as well. Uh, yes. So, uh, this is to uh, uh, Mr. Mukundan. Uh, in the current scenario, uh, what are the risks uh, that the internal auditor should really uh, focus on? How the scope uh, or the risk coverage uh, should change uh, for the internal auditor? So I think I'll come to that, uh, Puneet, but I just want to add a couple of layers to this whole issue of fraud risk assessment. I, one of the things we should do as part of the internal audit plan, which I would recommend most companies undertake, is once in two years or once in three years, depending on the periodicity and the, and the risk attached to a business, I think fraud risk assessment needs to be done. And you need to have an another agency come in and do forensic audit. Absolutely important. And I think we have unearthed many, many practices through this. And uh, I think it has come as a very good support mechanism to internal audit function. Uh, the second layer, what we also believe is that whistleblower mechanism you need to review. I think it's very important that you, you just don't rely on internal audit, but there's another mechanism called whistleblower. The third is the uh, ethics, uh, ethical conduct process, because we have a, a code of conduct, which is, uh, and the ethics process also needs to be reviewed. We have a third party line, which is not, uh, which is not owned by us. It is run by a third party and it is available to everybody. It's at the back of everybody's visiting card. If you look at our website, it tells you where you need to go and meet and complain about the company, anybody in the company. I think we have to put mechanisms in place. So rather than create laws for internal auditor, I think the processes have to be put in place where the access to information is available to the audit committee to act upon, which can come from any source. And I think we must take this seriously and not just brush it under the carpet. Many times whistleblower complaints come and, you know, the, 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 the committee say, no, no, I think we need to, I think we need to dive deep and get into detail. So that's my one point about, is it really internal audit issue or is it just a wider issue while there's an element of trust that we have in the direction? Uh, with uh, respect to this uh, uh, a point about, uh, sorry, uh, uh, could you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Given the current uh, scenario, the scenario yeah, I think we, we've, done the things, uh, we've, we've done a couple of things, Puneet. I think we've, uh, we first thing which we did was to look at credit risks of uh, our suppliers and our, uh, our uh, customers. It is very important that your ecosystem to whom you are supplying or buying, both are robust and stable because otherwise you will not survive. I think that was one big uh, exercise which we undertook and we actually have uh, taken a very difficult calls in many places if there's a credit risk uh, uh, to, uh, to the entire uh, some pieces of the ecosystem we de-risk ourselves in this uh, current situation so uh, we have to start with the process that cash is king cash is an emperor in this period i think it's very very important liquidity is very important focusing on liquidity is very critical uh, and generating ideas around liquidity is very critical uh, so, uh, I, I would certainly say in the short term, these are very important. Second is, how are you going to reimagine when you come out of this crisis? I think the whole element of uh, how the organization will look in future, internal audit needs to play a part in terms of assessing the risks. Are we ready? Are we ready to pivot to more digital? Which functions are more weak in terms of shifting to digital? Which functions are more ready to? I think assessment of that by internal audit to be very critical to senior management to sort of uh, also enable that entire organization moves to digital. It also could be an issue of ecosystem not moving digital while we want to move. I think that risk also they can identify very clearly. So post COVID era certainly presents opportunities, but they need to say that is the entire ecosystem moving and which pieces need uh, attention and care. Thanks a lot. Uh, so Puneet, uh, Puneet, I'm sorry, but we are already at 5.30. Do you think no. we could uh, have our closing remarks now? If you permit. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much for helping out with all those questions. Uh, uh, dear participants, uh, it is time to bring this uh, really vibrant and uh, insightful session uh, to a close. Uh, I think we've been totally overwhelmed uh, with the participation which has taken place at one point of time. I remember seeing almost 650 participants, 646 if I remember correctly. And uh, and I think uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, fantastic insights which were afforded by the panelists 
are uh, there for you to see. Uh, you know, there were there were so many learnings for me as an individual when Mr. Pramanik was speaking about how internal audit could help with the independence assurance, with trying to ensure that things are doing uh, are being done right the first time, uh, with the insight and the role which we could play in strategic risk, as well as. Uh, the support which we could get from the board and the uh, you know audit committees in terms of playing a greater role in governance and uh, tone at the top uh, dr haldia uh, i think uh, brought up some grassroots level questions which we need to ask ourselves that is internal audit performing as well as it could and the same thing applies to the audit committee the management as well as the regulators uh, there is a lot more needs to be done, so we need to question ourselves and we need to also wonder whether we can we do some more advocacy on this particular front. Uh, the fact that internal audit needs to get its dues, it needs to get an attractive compensation. And the fact that it needs to have a 1 to 1 uh, with management is also something which he highlighted. Uh, Mr. Mukundan, uh, you know, very correctly drew up the importance of trust. Uh, human values, uh, Niyat versus Niti. Uh, he spoke about the internal auditors, uh, three lines of defense model, the fact that they can be great partners and progress, uh, that the approach would need to depend on the evolution of internal audit, depending on the maturity of the organization per se, and how uh, we need to use a lot more technology. But in order to do that, we also need to ensure that the base digitization of documents which we use and trust in order to pass uh, an opinion or to provide an assurance also needs to be placed in place and adequately so so thank you all of you uh, it's absolutely been wonderful uh, thank you individually uh, Dr. Haldia, Mr. Pramanik, Mr. Mukundan, it's been absolutely wonderful. I think all of us have learned a lot and we do look forward to such opportunities. Uh, before I close, a big thank you once again uh, to Prodivity and IIA India and within Prodivity, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Agarwal, Mr. Sachin Thayal, uh, Nirmalyo, Puneet, Satish, thank you all for all the support which you provided in making this particular event, uh, I think, a grand success and a wonderful learning for most of us. Thank you and good night to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh